This is an ABC color presentation. This fireboat is patrolling a lakefront. Within a few minutes, it'll be entering a river. And it's because at this very spot, a lake and a river join, that one of the world's great cities was born. And we'll find out why today as Discovery visits Chicago, America's inland seaport. Discovery 68, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen. Hi, welcome to Discovery. When you think of Chicago, this is the skyline that comes to mind. Chicago, the second largest city in the country with almost four million people. And yet, in the early 19th century, when New York was one of the leading cities in the United States, Chicago was only a small trading post with about 20 houses grouped around a single fort. What made it the great city it is? Part of the answer is this lake. Lake Michigan, one of the five great lakes. Where this lake and a river met became the site and the reason for a trading post, then a fort, a village, and finally, a city. Although geography provided distinct advantages and reasons for the rise of a city, there also had to be the people that put the advantages to use. People who, despite seemingly overwhelming problems, even disasters, found ways of coming back, making their city better than ever. This lock, when it was built in 1938, did an unheard of thing at its time. It reversed the flow of a river. In this way, the water of Lake Michigan was kept pure of contamination so that it could be used as drinking water by the people of the city. This river isn't used only by small ships like a fireboat. Large freighters also use it. But most important, today a barge loaded with manufactured goods, ores, produce, or lumber can pass down the Chicago River and eventually reach the Mississippi. It can go from Chicago to New Orleans without a stop. On all sides rise the office buildings, factories, bridges that opened to let big ships through. All made possible because of a location that enabled people and goods to go from one place to another. And yet, this too needed the people to make it happen. In 1673, Louis Joliet and Father Jacques Marquette discovered that by carrying their canoes a distance of 12 miles, they were able to cross over from a river that led to the Mississippi to one that led to Lake Michigan. This was something long known by the Indians of the area, but it wasn't until over a hundred years later that this discovery started being put to use. It was in 1770 that the first house, a fur trading post, was built. It thrived, for fur trappers of the North Woods soon learned the advantages of paddling their canoes over Lake Michigan to this trading post near where lake and river met. From here, the furs could be sent southward. By 1803, there were enough people at the mouth of the Chicago River to warrant the United States building a fort, Fort Dearborn. But nine years later, disaster struck. Hostile Indians attacked, massacred women, children, soldiers, and burned Fort Dearborn to the ground. But the spirit 
that was to survive throughout the city's turbulent history had its start here, and a new and better Fort Dearborn was built. By 1833, a fort and a few log cabins with a total population of 500 had become a town. A canal was dug through the sandbar that prevented lake ships from entering the Chicago River. Former fur trappers from the North Woods, ambitious merchants from New England, one-time farmers from the prairie lands, all joined to build a city. By 1847, a canal was completed that made it possible to sail directly from Chicago to New Orleans. Now Chicago had a waterway that linked it to the south. Through Chicago came the produce from the rich prairie farmlands. Cattle, hogs, grain, destined for shipment to the rest of the nation. On the first day the canal was open, 16 vessels went through, the loaded barges heading southward. And heading north, the sugar from New Orleans, the cotton from Memphis. Within a decade, Chicago became one of the major shipping centers of the nation. Because of a lake that met a river that eventually connected with the Mississippi, a city was born. And on Lake Michigan and the Chicago River crowded the vessels of every description, barges and steamers built for lake and river traffic. But it wasn't until about 10 years ago that another kind of ship became a common sight in the city of Chicago, ocean-going ships. For with the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway, ships from all over the world can now sail here. 700 miles from the East Coast, 1,700 miles from the west coast, Chicago today is the world's biggest inland seaport. Today, a sailor leaves the same ship that also takes him to the great port cities of the world. Cities like New York, London, Sydney, Hong Kong, Honolulu. Chicago has now joined the roster of other important port cities. This city that had once laughingly been referred to as Mud City, plagued by swamps and frequent flooding, has long since become a great modern metropolis. Almost an entire city with all its buildings was raised as much as 10 feet by hard work and engineering ingenuity. A city of the prairies was made a city of the world. The city of warehouses, stockyards, and factories became a city of fine shops, museums, art galleries, symphonic halls, its own opera company. began because Chicago was a place well situated near water. But if it was water that put Chicago on the map, it was something else that helped keep it there. Rails. And we'll find out about that in just a minute. These freight cars in a little while may be carrying machine parts to Seattle, cosmetics to Atlanta, breakfast foods to New York. For from Chicago go tracks to every state in the country. But first, the trains must be made up. Every hour of every day, freight cars are pushed over the hump. At switching yards around the city, they get separated. Rolling down the grade on their own momentum, they get switched to the right track to become part of a new line of freight cars, a new train. 
Every day, an average of 24,000 freight cars are handled in Chicago's switching yards. More than that of New York and St. Louis combined. Almost 2,000 trains enter and leave the city every day. One every 48 seconds. 34 different railroad lines operate in Chicago, transporting people and hauling goods, making the city the railroad center of the nation. And yet, it wasn't until 1838 that the first mile of railroad track was laid in the state of Illinois. But within 17 years, almost 3,000 miles of railroad track had been laid, heading in every direction. Chicago's location in the heart of America made it the ideal city to join east and west. The newly developing railroads used it as their base for their expansion westward. As the railroads reached outward, the nation grew. And as new people flooded westward, the city grew. Because almost all rails led to Chicago, farmers shipped their produce here. Great granaries arose, and Chicago became the grain center of the nation. Also came another product of the farms, livestock, cattle, hogs, sheep, transforming Chicago into the meatpacking capital of the world. Want to sell me that load of cattle? That title no longer belongs to Chicago, although its great stockyards covering 345 acres are still in use. Livestock still gets shipped here, but mainly by trucks. Freight cars take them to the packing houses. It is sick. Yeah, Meat buyers still look the animals over and make their bids. There are still the sounds and the smells of an older day, with some very new touches added. At one time, about 8 million head of livestock a year passed through the Chicago stockyards. In the more than 100 years of its existence, that's over a billion, 200 million cattle, sheep, and hogs. Chicago is still the leading cattle market in the world, but now its leadership has extended to other fields. As Chicago became the gateway to the West and its farmlands, Farm equipment manufacturers started building their factories here. In addition to the masts of sailing ships, another shape rose against the sky. Factories needed steel, and so did railroads. Today, the Chicago area is one of the country's great steel producers, and Chicago, one of the foremost industrial cities of the nation. But where Chicago's Halstead Street meets 39th Street, the entrance to the stockyards still stands. Wally Mander has been buying cattle for over 20 years. He's from Germany. But like others before him who came to Chicago to build it, remake it, he calls himself a Chicagoan. On these streets, cowhands once headed steers for the stalls. Conestoga wagons once passed with wheels sinking deep in mud. That's changed. But there are reminders of raw and lusty yesterdays when Chicago was, in the words of Carl Sandburg, the hog butcher of the world. Barges connected Chicago with the Deep South. Railroads made it a transportation hub for the entire nation. And now jets have made Chicago a transportation center for the entire world. This is Chicago's O'Hare International Airport, the world's biggest, busiest airport. On an average day, nearly half of all the commercial jets in the United States touch down here. Don Polston was born in Chicago. His father came here over 60 years ago, and his first job was for a railroad. Don's keeping up a family tradition He's still in transportation, but by air. Uh, the Ozark 861, runway 32 left, cleared for takeoff. Uh, Ozark 861, don't know. Roger. 
Every 40 seconds, a plane takes off or lands at O'Hare, an average of 70,000 passengers a day. Don's job is to help them come and go. As soon as feasible, contact departure. Nineteen different airlines connect Chicago directly with overseas cities. In keeping with its tradition, Chicago is still the city for people on the move. they had come from the North Country. Fur trappers who put up the first houses, brave swamps and floods. Then the others came, settlers and soldiers, to rebuild a fort and set out anew. And as a city was born, they came not only from the East, the South, and the West. They came from Germany, from Ireland, from Poland, from nations big and small, and those in between. They came to build a city. They also remained to rebuild it, when one of this nation's greatest disasters nearly destroyed Chicago. We'll find out about it in just a minute. This is a training academy for firemen. What these men learn today will enable them to save lives and property tomorrow. This academy's location is a fitting one, for on this very spot began one of the worst fires in American history, the Chicago Fire. This statue commemorates that fateful October evening back in 1871, when a hot, dry wind was blowing over the city and in a barn behind the house of a couple named Patrick and Catherine O'Leary, a cow was supposed to have knocked over a lantern. There'd been hardly any rain all that summer. Whipped by the dry wind, the fire spread quickly in every direction. Within an hour, it was moving toward the heart of the city. Delays, confusion hampered the firefighters. Equipment broke down, and still the fire spread. Warehouses along the river sprang up in flames. Lumberyard suddenly disappeared from sight. The Randolph Street Bridge, one of the few still standing, was packed with men, women, and children trying to escape the flames. Many headed for the river in an attempt to flee the fire. For three days, the fire raged. And then it was over, and three and a half square miles of a once proud city lay in ruins. Destroyed were over 18,000 homes, hotels, stores, schools, churches, factories, and government buildings. The known dead, 250. A similar number was never accounted for. And then, as it happened before, people started to work to bring their city back, slowly at first. But the signs of a continuing belief and faith in a city were there. Chicago would be rebuilt and it would be bigger and better than ever before. This tower, used to pump water throughout the city, was one of the few structures in the burned out area that was left standing. The water tower is still standing. It's a reminder of an old Chicago in a city that's been built out of stone and steel, proof of its ability to bounce back. For the new Chicago helped transform cities around the world. Its buildings became a model for architects elsewhere. The world's first skyscraper was built in Chicago. And even today, its buildings are in the forefront of building design. But even with its modern look, 
its business and entertainment area still bears the name of something out of the city's past. The Loop, named for the elevated structure, or L, built in 1897, that still forms a loop over the city's downtown area. It's as if Chicago, though it looks to the future, still has its ties with its own past. Chicago means many things. In the Iroquois Indian language, it meant little onion because a lot of them used to grow in the swampy area around here. Another Indian meaning was queen of the lake. What's the real Chicago? Well, for the millions here, it's a city where they can live and work, where they can relax and learn in fine museums, a planetarium, several zoos, an aquarium, it's where they can play in summer on the miles of beach, right at the city's front door. But it's also a city for people on the go, whether by water, rail, or air. But most of all, it's a city that still seeks to live up to its motto, born with the Chicago fire. I will. Chicago, America's inland seaport. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed today's program. If you'd like to find out more about Chicago, its past, present, and future, ask your librarian for these books. Blue Water Boundary by Alida Malkus and Chicago, A Pictorial History by Herman Cogan and Lloyd Went. Be with us next week as Discovery continues to discover America. Bye-bye. The Discovery Unit's transportation and promotional consideration provided by United Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News and Public Affairs.